Yes, God. God, we worship you this morning, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. God, that we would see you in a new way this morning. God, that you clear our hearts and clear our minds today. We welcome you in this place, Lord Jesus. Not just a room, not just a building, but God, we welcome you to our hearts this morning. God, we just lift up our voices. The Bible says that if we don't lift our voices, if we don't express outwardly our praise to him, that the rocks will cry out in our place. I don't know about you, but most of our rocks are covered up by snow right now. So let's be the ones 
that vocally, outwardly express praise to Him. And that might be a little scary for some of us because sometimes we're not super vocal and we're like, well, I don't know, what, if, what does that mean? I don't know. Well, then we just whisper, God, I praise you. It's just real simple. God, I praise you. God, I lift you up. God, you are higher than anything else, God. I want you to be my focus. I don't want my circumstances. I don't want all this stuff to be my focus. So we express outwardly and we lift Jesus up. That's praise. So can we just do that for a few moments this morning? Can we just lift up praise in this place and welcome him here in praise? exalted in this place. And you would be lifted up.
thinking this morning that uh, maybe there's some of us that just need to be reminded. I know that I need to be reminded that there's more to this life than what we see and what we live on a daily basis. And God's kingdom is moving. He's active. And, and, and the Bible says that we are here only for just a mist. It's like a mist. It's squirted off in the air and then you can't see it. And I just think some of us, and I know some of you watching just by talking with you, we all need to be reminded that there's more than just what we see and what we're walking through right now. That there's something greater, something even bigger. And, and life on the other side, a place that's called heaven that we really don't know much about, um, beyond that, that it's just what I'm doing right now. It's, you can't even describe it, right? But it's better, it's, it's greater because Jesus is there. His spirit is here, and that's what the only thing that can sustain us, right? But Jesus is there. He says that I've gone to prepare a place for you, for us. So whatever we're going through, whatever you're going through this morning, I just want to encourage you that there's more than just this temporary thing that we walk through, this, this thing that we call life. Would you pray with me this morning? feel comfortable this morning and, and that's you that just speaks to you that man that was me I need to be reminded can I just invite you to lift your hand or your hands to the Lord and I just trust that as we do that this morning that he's going to just remind us that he's here with us that there's more than just what we see Jesus that's us this morning would you remind us that you have a place for us and, and you call it home. Lord, we sing songs about heaven all the time. Lord, I sing songs about heaven all the time. And yet sometimes I doubt. Sometimes I struggle because I forget what an incredible place that is going to be. That you'll wipe every tear away. That our sickness and our sadness will be gone. He'll be gone. That we won't need the light of day because you are there and you are the light. And we'll be in your presence face to face. Incredible, Jesus. Remind us this morning there's so much more that you prepared a place for us that's called home.
celebrate the fact that Jesus has prepared a place for us. Amen. It's a great reminder, and it's something that we have to teach our kids, that there's more than just what we see. And our kids are here this morning. We love our kids. Don't we love our kids? Yeah. Our kids are in church this morning, and, and uh, Kim is going to come up, and she's going to share a little bit about kids' ministry, and then uh, I think she's going to say something. Uh, Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I am here to talk about True North Kids. And in the preschool room, where I spend my time, we do a lot of simple participation games. So you get to play today. So I want you to put your hands on your nose if you are seeking a place to use your spiritual gifts. Anybody? Anybody? OK, I see a few. Now, I want you to wiggle your fingers at me if you should be seeking a place to use your spiritual gifts. I see a few fingers. Okay, good. So those of us who've taken the Rooted series, it says, seek opportunities to use these gifts. So I'm going to ask you, it's not just teaching gift that we use with the True North kids. I was thinking about it the other night. It's really all the gifts. So Pray and think about how you, if you could, use your gift, gifts out there with the kids. So I really would ask you to think about that. And the sign-up sheets are in the back. The dates we're looking for is April through September. You only teach every other month. And it's kind of nice because then when you get in here back in big church and you hear worship music, you're like, oh, hallelujah. <laughs> It sounds and feels so good, and it's great. It's really wonderful when you're out there. Um, the training for the teachers is also March 24th, right after church. Um, so I am going to, was I supposed to do anything else? I don't think so. That's it. So I'm going to pray for the kids, and then, but the adults, you stay right here because I still have more activities for you. So kids. We are so thankful you are here. And Lord, thank you for bringing the children here to learn about you. And I thank you for the adults in their lives who brought them here today. And I just ask you to speak to the adults who you would have be out there teaching and using their gifts with them. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Okay, kids, you can go out to your classrooms. Adults. More participation. Everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. You guys are kind of slow. The kids are better at this. Okay. Now, I want you to turn to your neighbors near and far and greet them this morning.
All right, everyone, let's head back to our seats real quickly. Let's head back to our seats. Just a moment here. Good morning, everybody. It's been a crazy week. Lots of snow. Um, I didn't go to school a single day. And now I have another week-long break. So, so God's doing something special for us. Uh, so it's good to be back um, after a long week of not being a long week of not being here. Uh, if you guys saw the parking lot pictures on Facebook or Instagram, it was pretty piled up with snow. <laughs> so kind of nice to not have to drive through that. But uh, I'd like to invite the ushers forward this morning. Lots of awesome, wonderful, beautiful people, and I'd just like to pray over the offering real quickly. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us back here after a hectic week of lots of snow. And God, even though our schedules might have got messed up, Lord, we just thank you for bringing us back to our center, right where we need to be, Lord, on this fine Sunday morning. And I just pray that we can give uh, thankfully and with an open heart. In your name we pray, amen. amen. So because of the snow, uh, worship night was supposed to be last Thursday, but it is getting moved to this Thursday, February 21st. Uh, it's a great opportunity to get out here, um, get out of your typical Sunday routine, weekly routine, and um, just see God in another uh, atmosphere. Also, we have more trivia coming up on March 24th. Uh, man, I suck at trivia. <laughs> but uh, last time when we had karaoke and I ended up getting sick, so hopefully I don't get sick this time because I love to compete and have fun. So it's a great opportunity to get out here with the church family. Um, have fun, play some games, and uh, just enjoy each other's presence. And then lastly, I would, lastly, I would like to talk about um, usher signups. Um, for those of you that haven't, um, you know, had the chance to become an usher or have been wondering, like, you know, what you have to do to become an usher, the church currently is looking for ushers, and I think this is just a great way to start uh, in serving the kingdom. For me, uh, I didn't jump up right here immediately. I got the chance to start ushering first. And it, at first, I was just kind of like, I didn't really, like, I was uncomfortable just kind of standing there and passing the basket around. But then, like, you know, as I started doing it more and more, I started seeing, like, you know, there's, the, I'm serving the Lord, you know, and this is just one of the many ways you can do it. And so, for me, it's just giving me, like, the comfortability to just come up here and talk. And uh, it's just a great way for um, those to serve the Lord. And then um, this week, one more thing, actually. I was just going about my week, and my mom, she loves to send me Bible verses, a special mom I have. So I was just hanging around with friends, and my mom sent me and my brothers this verse, and it comes in Habakkuk 3, 17 through 18. And notice how I actually had the Bible verse pulled up this time. So it's progress. <laughs> and it says, though the fig tree does not, <clears throat> man, though the fig tree does not blossom, and there's no fruit on the vines, Though the yield of the olive fails and the fields produce no food, though the flock is cut off from the fold and there are no cattle in the stalls, yet I will choose to rejoice in the Lord. I will choose to shout in exultation in the victorious God of my salvation. Amen. And so as I was reading this verse, you know, sometimes you just read verses and you kind of just read through them. But I read it and then like after I read it, I just kind of like paused. And I was like, dang, I mean, that, that's powerful. And, you know, it's so easy for us as Christians to, when life's going good, to, you know, thank God and be all in, be posting, you know, scriptures on your Instagram, your Facebook, um, be messaging your friends, being all positive. But what I really love about this verse is that it talks about, you know, praising God even when the times aren't good. You know, when you've been working hard and you've seen nothing come of it, but to keep praising God and choosing to rejoice in what God's given you. And so this week, as you go about your week, I just want to empower you guys to, no matter what happens and no matter what you see in your life, just to keep praising God through it because good things will come of it. Amen. And with that, I'd like to welcome up Pastor Alex. All right, you're all in.
Cindy would love to meet with you. Want to meet in the high school room afterwards? Yeah. If you'd like to just ask questions like, what kind of things do you have need of? What sort of things could I do? Does it have to be every single week? Is it just once in a while? Um, there's all kinds of things that you could do to bless those men and help get them back on the path that Jesus has for them. Okay, so right after church today. Second thing is if you have filled out a missions commitment card and haven't turned it in yet, uh, you can do so today. Just uh, throw them in a basket right there on your way out or hand them to Andrea at the window. And uh, if you haven't filled one out and you intended to, please do that so we can let our missionaries know by the end of this month, we've got one more Sunday, uh, what they can expect from us uh, this coming year. And if you filled one out last year, yes, we do ask that you would fill out another one again, just in case numbers have changed. We want a fresh number for our missionaries uh, every single year. It depends. Is it positive? No. Huh? Okay. Praise God. I'm glad that he's still walking with Jesus. That's awesome. Thank you. That's good news, Karen. Thank you. Um, just a little bit of family business. Once a year, we... Uh, are asked by our denomination to elect new council members to serve as an advisory board for financial management of RCC. And so uh, the last two years, we've had four council members. I'd like them to stand up uh, so you can just see who they are. Jen Thompson, Norm Ingersoll, I was going to say, <laughs> Norm Arnold, Ingersoll's in heaven. Doug Hansen and Eric Munch have been serving us for the last couple of years. Can we just say thanks to all four of them? All right, you can be seated. And uh, sadly, both Norm and Jen have served their two-year terms, so they're rotating out. And so we need to vote for two more council members for this coming two-year period. And uh, I'd like to introduce those nominees to you. They are on this card. Anybody that didn't get a, a ballot that would like one? There's one over here. Raise your hand high. There you go. And uh, I understand you may not know all three of these guys, but I'd like to at least give you a chance to see who they are. So Gary Josephson, would you stand, please? Everybody say hi, Gary. Hi, Gary. OK. And then Tony Diedrichs. Everybody say hi, Tony. Hi. And Doug Ellis in the very far back corner. Everybody say hi, Doug. Hi. So this is kind of um, challenging, I know, because technically we should be praying and fasting for three months before we vote, right? But I believe the Holy Spirit is really good at spontaneity as well. So if you could take a moment right now, grab a pen somewhere nearby, and could you check two of those names and then fold it in half and send it to the center aisle here? And uh, while you're at it, if you know for sure you're an official member, meaning you've gone through a class, you've received a certificate, you've signed a covenant uh, to be an RCC member, uh, check that box yes. If the answer is no or not sure, it's okay. We're actually going to count all the votes no matter what. So go ahead and just say, Lord, who shall I put check marks by? And if you don't know any of them, you don't have to vote. Don't feel pressured. All right, and the ushers are going to come by. As soon as you're done, just send them to the aisles. Either way, or wave them in the air. Thanks for doing this for us. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. All right, I think I've covered all those bases. We're ready to roll. So um, I was out car shopping uh, yesterday with Marcelo, and uh, he and Claire need a new car because their old one almost blew up. The oil just <laughs> So it was kind of one of those emergency, whether you want to or not, you have to have another car. So we're shopping all over the place down in the south end, and we went to this one lot, um, and we had the kids. Dads were on kid duty that day, so kids were in the car seat, and so I'm entertaining them while Marcelo's driving around. And uh, we finally got to a spot where we said, we really need to take time and look around at several cars here. So let's, let's get the kids out of the car, bring them into their little waiting room where there's toys and stuff and things that they shouldn't get into, like all the keys for every vehicle was on a table. <laughs> so 
So I had a little work to do. So Marcelo got to walk around the sales guy, and, and um, before he went out there, we asked the sales guy, hey, is, do you have anything on your TV for kids? He goes, oh, yeah, I got all kinds of stuff. So he starts clicking through things, and, and he went to the children's part, and you know, most children's movies are not for children. Have you noticed that? They're like, the humor is adult humor. They're very scary. And, and so we're looking for something, you know, anything like a little baby animal show or, you know, how about a Daniel Tiger or something like that, you know, or Veggie Tales, you know, something or other. Um, I said, why don't you just go shopping for cars? I'll click through and see what's out there. So we couldn't find anything. I mean, everything was just like, I, I played, it was Woody Woodpecker. And Tabby goes, that's scary. <laughs> You, there's just really nothing. So I'm thinking, why don't you have Veggie Tales or something like that? I don't know. It was uh, nobody died, but we actually turned off the TV. And uh, speaking of Veggie Tales, I I just hope Veggie Tales is for adults too. Have you noticed that? It's like the Bible verses are so like deep. And anyway, I hope if they ever make a Veggie Tale about the disciple who betrayed Jesus, I hope they call it Judas is a carrot. I think that would be. <laughs> That would be perfect. So, speaking of um, s silly things, you know one of the silliest things that I, I think was ever invented is um, autocorrect on your phone. How many of you use autocorrect? How many of you like it? Yeah, yeah, I was, yeah. And, and, I've just learned you just don't hit send until you reread it thoroughly, right? So, so I sent out this text this week to the staff, and I said, hey, guys, I just want to make sure we got Children's Worship Sunday figured out, you know, logistics, who's going when. You guys got that all figured out. And, and one of them said back to me, oh, yeah, we do have it all figured out. Sorry we didn't include you in the loop. And then I texted back, um, hey, you don't need to include me in the loop. I'm, I'm just kind of checking in. If you guys do this every month and you take care of it, I'm a happy camper, so I'm, I'm doing that. If you guys take care of it, I'm a happy camper. It comes out. If you guys take care of it, I'm a happy vampire. <laughs> <sighs> and that's, that's a true story. Unbelievable. I heard um, somebody once say, if you don't believe in autocorrect, you're going straight to heal. <laughs> so the reason I brought up autocorrect is because um, sometimes we turn Christianity into things that we think should be sort of like easy and automatic. And especially this idea of making disciples, being a disciple. You know, people are really strong on strategies and pathways and classes and linear approaches. And all of those things are valuable and important, but, but I don't see a whole lot of linear discipleship going on between Jesus and his disciples. There's a whole lot of just living together and just kind of taking things on as life throws it at them. And so that's why I, I've learned it's really much more important to develop a culture, an atmosphere for disciples to grow and be challenged and be encouraged and to be taught. And a lot of times it's anecdotal, it's incidental, it's unplanned. But if in our hearts and our minds we're saying, I am a disciple, I want to be open to be discipled at all times to the Holy Spirit, to my brothers and sisters, then that's going to be a much more fruitful and organic kind of growth. So I, I'm really excited about this idea of building a discipleship culture. And <laughs> somebody said to me a couple weeks ago, we love your um, Amish house building series. It's really been good. <laughs> I just used it because the word building kind of matched the thing. It's really more about fishers of men. So let's do this. I want to um, just do a couple of review things. Um, Jesus, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, when it was time for him to aim for the sorts of people he wanted and thought would be successful at reproducing what he was doing and taking his mission to the world, he looked no further than Galilee. He said, hands down, that's the region, that's the neighborhood, I, I think the best and most qualified potential disciples will come from. And, uh, well, I'll show you the map again. Do you remember the Sea of Galilee? Um, all these towns that were surrounding it. You know, uh, Jesus lived in Nazareth at the time, about 20 miles south. And then Jerusalem was about 70 miles south of that. 
And so instead of looking south from his home in Nazareth when he was, you know, ordained, baptized, launched as the Messiah on mission, he didn't turn to the religious community. He turned away from them and went even further north, further from the religious community to this Sea of Galilee neighborhood. And I, I want to come back to that map in a few minutes, but, but let's just kind of review a couple of things that I think are critical and really helpful to hear over and over again. And, and one of them is this, that a discipling culture needs a firm foundation. The culture has to be built on something solid and reproducible and teachable, something you could repeat over and over and over again. And so I, I kind of went to the Lord and said, well, what kind of foundation is that? And I, I discovered it's not what you would think. It's not getting a degree in theology. It's not having this highly structured and organized class three-year series. Although I'm going to say over and over again, strategies, classes, pathways are definitely part of it. But they're, they're not foundational. They're just kind of like the tools. The foundation I discovered Jesus used was to find, here it is, find broken lives who are hungry to change. Start with broken lives who are hungry to change. People who may have got some really bad habits, but who have a potential for those habits to be turned right side up and used for good. I heard somebody once say, um, he was a drug dealer down in Los Angeles, made lots of money, very successful, had a, literally an organized business. He had employees, and he had shuttlers, and he had, he had accountants, and this, and this kid was like 19 years old. And he met Jesus, and he told his pastor, my former life was just horrible. It is awful. There is nothing about it that I can ever bring into the kingdom. And his pastor said, oh, you are so wrong. You'll make an excellent organizer in the kingdom of God. You will be an awesome evangelist in the kingdom of God. You'll be really good at finances in the kingdom of God. All you got to do is let him redeem that. See, that's the, the process God seems to be using is finding broken people who are hungry to be changed. And that's really all it takes. Because that hunger is what will drive us and drive others into everything God has for us. And so I want to read this passage here. But before I do, let me give you a little bit of background. This is right in the spot in Luke where um, Jesus has come back from the wilderness, the temptation. He's already been baptized. And then it says he went into the synagogue in Nazareth as was his custom. So in other words, he had been standing up and speaking in the synagogue week after week after week, perhaps year after year after year. They were familiar with him. He was familiar with the folks in the congregation. And so he kind of knew what he was getting into when he finally stood up to say, in the prophecy of Isaiah, today in your hearing, this prophecy is fulfilled. I'm the Messiah. And immediately criticism began. Now, sure, he was a hero when he went out and healed people, and there were crowd, large crowds turning on the mountain, things like that. But in his local congregation, they did not like that one bit. And so he's already getting pushback. And so he says to them, listen, I know what you're going to do. In a short time, you're going to say to me, Jesus, why don't you do here in Nazareth what you did at Capernaum? There were miracles in Capernaum left and right. And this is where that famous line comes from. And he responded, Everybody knows a prophet is never appreciated in his hometown. That's why I have to leave. And so here's where we come to the scripture, and, and Jesus begins to say, you know, this is not the first time God has gone outside his community of Jewish family. Not the first time he's gone beyond the walls of Judaism. And so he begins to repeat um, some things that all the Israelites knew about. He says to them, I assure you that there were many widows in Israel, widows who had need right there in Israel. When the sky was shut for three and a half years, there was a severe famine throughout the land. The need was great right here, and yet God did not send Elijah to them. Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon, up, oops, excuse me, up north, kind of where Lebanon is right now on the coast. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha. Lost plenty of need right here at home. 
Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. Definitely not kosher. So God is in the habit of going outside of the expected crowd to do what he wants to do. And can we just stop and say right there, I'm thankful. I, I was one of those. I wasn't in the in crowd. I was not an insider when Jesus found me. Some of us were. Perhaps you were raised in church. Perhaps you were born in a Christian family. Hallelujah. You're also included. But it seems that the firm foundation God loves to use is going after really broken, lost people who are hungry for change. And so they got, they got up. The people, after hearing this, drove him out of the town and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. Wow, welcome, Jesus. Messiah, we're so thankful you're here. Hallelujah. And I've always wondered about this next verse. I still, I've, how did this happen? But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. And then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee. This is so fascinating to me because he makes the big announcement, knew the crowd, probably knew what kind of reception he was going to get because he'd been speaking as was his custom week after week after week. He knew what was going to happen, and somehow God miraculously delivered him, and he went on his merry way, 20 miles further north. Let's go find some people who are a mess. The uh, neighborhood around the Sea of Galilee, as I mentioned before, the Sea of Galilee is about the size of Lake Washington, but it was, it's more round. Lake Washington is long and skinny. The Sea of Galilee doesn't have forests and mountains and gullies and houses and traffic and freeways. It's a desert. In fact, the Sea of Galilee is 686 below sea level. So it's dry. So you could walk around the thing in a, a day or so. It really was not tough. So the neighborhoods were all very congenial. They, they got along. They traded with one another. The fishermen fed everybody in the neighborhood. So there's a whole lot of community relationships going on. So it was easy for them to kind of move around. And so it's not unlikely that the disciples that Jesus chose knew one another ahead of time. The fishermen had to pay taxes. They probably went to Levi in Capernaum to pay their taxes to Rome. Um, let's go through some of those towns. The map again. Um, the word Capernaum comes from the Hebrew word Kafarnaum, which actually means home of the prophet Nahum. Interesting. That's where Nahum lived. But the actual meaning of the word Capernaum, it means disorderly communicate, uh, accumulation of objects and clutter, both of people and things. Okay, so now you've got a, a picture. We're talking south side of Chicago, basically. <laughs> You know, it's just, it's just a mess. And then when you begin looking at some of the characters, the major players in that neighborhood, you've got to go, wow. One of the things that a lot of people miss is that when Joshua first was commanded to come in and take the land from the Canaanites, the Canaanites, as you know, were really ugly people. I mean, they sacrificed children to Molech, their god, they were demon worshipers, just incredibly immoral people. Joshua did not drive the Canaanites out completely. So Jews and Canaanites lived together. So now you've got this Canaanite influence up here in the northern regions of Israel. In addition to that, you've got these characters that the Bible talks about. Remember the town on the lower right, Gadara? Who's from Gadara? The Gadarene demoniac, okay? And that's the one Jesus delivered of a legion of demons. Now, the thing you have to realize is demoniacs, demon-energized humans, don't get that way overnight. They get that way through a series of incremental decisions to sin. Basically, it's an invitation for the devil to start piling on. Every time he took a step to agree with what the devil tempted him to do, the devil said, fine, thank you. I'll take more and more and more territory. So for someone to be so completely obsessed possessed or energized by a demon. It, it, there just had to be an environment, an environment where that, all that was possible and potential. Okay, so it's a rough neighborhood. Um, Mary, the prostitute, Mary Magdalene, we talked about her a couple weeks ago, um, probably made her way around the lake from town to town, time to time, or people around the lake came to her from time to time. Not a pretty place. Then there's loudmouth Peter from Bethsaida, he lived up in the north. 
And then there are the sons of thunder, the two obnoxious, aggressive brothers called James and John. They lived in Capernaum. So you've got all of these rough and tough characters that Jesus says, that's perfect. That's perfect. That's where I'm going to find my disciples. And what's amazing, too, is remember, it was later on that it says Jesus went to the mountain to pray, and he prayed all night. And it was the following day that the Lord gave him the names of the 12. This is after he first went and met them on the lake. This is a few weeks later, a few months later. So we know that now God the Father is confirming, yeah, you went to the right neighborhood, and yes, these are the right guys. And he named them, all 12 of them, by name. But the amazing thing is Capernaum had an amazing experience of the power and holiness of God. So in this, this dark and fairly dirty place, this is also the spot where four friends took their paraplegic buddy, put him on a mat, tore the roof off a house, and lowered him at the feet of Jesus. Miracle. He's forgiven of his sin. Holy moment, powerful moment. Healed, took up his mat and walked away. This is also the place where a Roman centurion came to Jesus and said, Jesus, my servant is ill. He's near death. I'll go if you just give me the word. In fact, would you let me take you with me? And Jesus said, no, I'll just tell you right now, your servant is healed. Go and see for yourself. And sure enough, he went back there healed. Well, this is the Capernaum where Jesus spoke the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, right up on the northwest shore, there are some, some low hills, just kind of low slopes. I went on and Google mapped it, and there's just some beautiful low, low sloping open meadows where Jesus got into the boat. The entire Sermon on the Mount was given. This is the same Capernaum where Jesus spoke the Beatitudes, some of the most timeless, powerful, godly points of truth ever written. This is the same Capernaum where Jesus responded when the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. So this place of great darkness, rough neighborhood, is also a place where God's amazing miracles took place. And my point is this. The firmest foundation for a discipling culture has to begin with people who are simply hungry. So for us this morning, I think if we just come back to that simplicity, that simple truth, and say, how hungry am I for all that God has for me? Am I satisfied? Am I satiated? Do I just kind of gloss over my weaknesses, my brokenness, and just go, ah, whatever? Or do I actually go, Lord, I'm still a mess. I've been working with this for 25 years or 15 years or two months, and it's still, it's not fixed, Lord. I I need you, I need you to shape me and change me. I'm hungry for you. I, I really love it when you come into situations where Christians are gathering together, and you can just sense there's a hunger in the room. The way people talk, they're not like flaunting their stuff, you know, and they're not like, a, and, or, you know, when you ask for prayers, they're not always praying for Aunt Mabel in Illinois, you know, they're actually going, oh, it's me, man. You just have that atmosphere. There, there's teachability and humility, right, and hunger. That's the atmosphere, the kind of culture that Jesus was trying to develop here. And that's what he saw in those men. As tough as they seemed on the outside, they were tenderhearted on the inside. So that's the question. Am I hungry still for God to finish what he started in me? Or Lord, you chose me even though my life was an absolute disaster before. But is it possible that some of those disastrous behaviors and habits could actually be flipped around for good? Like the drug dealer who became an amazing evangelist? That's what a discipling culture does. And that begins with us individually. So, just to start this morning, I want to um, just pray and say, Lord, can you show us and help us right now in this way? Father, would you first of all, just remind us how gracious you are to demonstrate by such living color examples the disciples you chose were uh, certainly no better than us. And yet they changed the world. They were the ones who became the fearless world changers. Lord, we want to be like that. 
would you show me, show us, Lord, the areas of our lives where um, you still have work to do, and you will gently and kindly, patiently, but persistently finish the work if we just say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Maybe you could name what that area is for you right now, just quietly to yourself, and say, Lord, I'm, I'm ready to keep going. I, I'm coming back. Work on me here. Change me into the image of your son. Set me free. Heal me, Lord God. In your mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. The second thing is a discipling culture needs Christians to be engaged like Jesus was. Engaged with the culture, the community around them, just like Jesus was. And uh, the Pharisees, what's interesting is the Pharisees distinguished themselves by who they avoided. Isn't that interesting? Look who I don't hang out with. That, like that's something to celebrate, you know. And Jesus distinguished himself by those he engaged. So this story is a familiar one, but it's really, uh, again, very illuminating. When he was invited after he said to Levi, the tax collector, hey, would you come and follow me? Um, Never goes, Levi goes, yeah, I'm in. And by the way, I'm so excited. Can you come and have dinner with me? And so he invited Jesus over. And I don't know if Jesus knew, but the entire house was packed with all his fellow tax gatherers, you know, the scum of the earth. And so Jesus is just kind of enjoying fellowship or at least conversation with them. And the Pharisees didn't like it. Apparently they were hanging out around the house or something. I don't know how they, looking in the windows, who knows. But they knew Jesus is here. And they said, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So we often, and I think in the current contemporary church in America and around the world, Western world, I've come a long way, I believe, in not disassociating ourselves with sinners, right, or unbelievers. We've come a long way in terms of just saying, okay, we have to embrace at least hang out with, at least influence and engage with those who don't yet know Christ. And uh, it's interesting, there are a lot of uh, young churches now, especially up in Seattle, or I know a handful, not a lot, there may be a lot, but I only know of a few, where they have church now at a winery. Another one's having a church at a tavern, and that's their meeting spot, you know, and um, there's probably alcohol involved. But what the purpose is, is because these young people recognize that all of their unsaved friends, that's their world. They go and hang out after work. They go out and hang out on weekends. And so they're bringing the gospel right into a place where a lot of Christians wouldn't dare to step foot. That's revolutionary. I think that's pretty powerful. It's pretty cool. There is, however, a danger in that if we take what Jesus has done here too far, we suddenly lose our influence. We lose our impact. How can that happen? What, what am I talking about? Let me give you an example. You could read this verse, and you could conclude, I'll put it in a sentence. Since Jesus had dinner with, partied with, hung out with sinners in the places where they congregated, we should do so too, right? That's, we just described, yep, that's kind of what the church is learning to do. Cool. Go get them. But... That leaves an open door for some real problems here. So you might have to change that just a little bit because what if somebody said, you know what, there's a lot of sinners down at the strip club. Let's go hang out with them, and we'll show them what Jesus does. Well, wait a minute. There could be a problem with that. So you might have to amend your sentence a little bit to say, since Jesus had dinner with, partied with, and hung out with sinners in the places where they congregated, we should do so too when they're not engaging in sin. I remember years ago, um, a young man here at RCC, um, he did just that. He went to a strip club. I've never been to one, by the way, praise God, so I have no idea. But then he brought one of the gals to church. And he told me that's what he did, and I, and I just went, oh, it gives me the chills. <laughs> 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 And so I had to, uh, we didn't actually have this conversation, but I had to think about that because I was sort of applauding him, but then kind of go, wait, there's something wrong with this, you know? How about if you hang out with that girl after work? 
How about you go give her some, buy her some coffee or something like that? How about outside of her job, you know? So let's kind of amend that and say when they're not engaging in their sin. A lot of you have friends who are uh, probably from the homosexual community. Hang out with them, but not while they're engaging in something you cannot support. And then the next problem is if um, our ultimate purpose in being with them is not ultimately for the kingdom to advance. And we're just hanging out because it's fun or we want to be liked. A lot, of, a lot of Christians do. I mean, friendship evangelism does take a long time. That's what we're doing across the street at the school. It takes a long time. But without making people a project, we still have to have an ultimate objective to extend the kingdom of God into the life of someone that Jesus died for, Jesus loves, that he's sad for their brokenness and their lostness and, and really wants to rescue. We have to ultimately say, Lord, maybe today you could open a door for me to begin a conversation about you. So we have to secondly ask the question, uh, okay, they're not engaging in sin, but I'm just doing it because I like hanging out and I'm having fun. No, let's amend that a little further. Since Jesus had dinner with, partied with, hung out with sinners in the places where they congregated, we should do so too when they're not engaging in sin and we do so for the purpose of calling them to repentance. Now that sounds like a hard line because most of us are, are not ever going to be good at saying, you need to repent, sinner. You probably don't want to get good at that. I don't know how effective that is. So you got to kind of tone down the language a little bit. A lot of times the way we call people to repentance is just by saying, no thanks, I, I'm going to have a Coke instead. I'm good. Versus, no, I don't drink. <laughs> right? We call people to repentance by our example. Just by living a different life, but doing it kindly and graciously with no judgment, no pointing fingers or any of that. But still, there's still one more issue that we have to come up with. What if we're hanging out with those people and they're already Christians? They're professing to be Christ, followers of Christ, but they're still engaging in things that you know Jesus would not approve of. We might have to qualify our statement just a little further. Since Jesus had dinner with, partied with, and hung out with sinners in the places where they congregated, we should do so too when they're not engaging in sin, we do so for the purpose of calling them to repentance, and when our presence does not condone sin or the mocking of God. So we have to be really careful. Like, I have some stories I could tell, but I don't want to divulge identity, so I'll just have to do something generically. It, it, that's a tough line. If you're, if you're hanging out with unbelievers and they're just living the unbelieving life, like many of us used to live, um, they're just going to do and say things that, that both mock God or they condone sin. And somehow we have to figure out, Lord, how do I, how do I make sure they understand I have a standard that I'm living up to? I have to answer to Jesus. And I'm not condoning this. And I can't give you a, a hard and clear answer on that. But what we can definitely do is not applaud. Oh, that was such a funny joke about Jesus. You know, just avoid those kinds of things. Don't say, if someone were to ask me, what do you think about my lifestyle? I would have to answer honestly. But if they don't ask me what I think about their lifestyle, I really don't have permission to tell them what I think about their lifestyle until the Lord opens a door or I get some kind of heavenly mandate to turn into the prophet Elijah and just blast them, you know? And that's not as common as some people would like it to be. It's, it's really not our job unless God has clearly called you to be the prophet Elijah in their life. So let's amend it one more time. Since Jesus had dinner with, partied with, hung out with sinners in the places where they congregated, we should do so too when they're not engaging in sin. Okay, so let's, let's meet after the party. And have coffee. We do so for the purpose of calling them to repentance that ultimately they know why we're hanging out. Not only that we like them as people, we do enjoy the time together where there is some mutual symbiotic benefit between us. It's not all ministry all the time. People can smell that. But they do know ultimately we care about their eternal soul. We really care about their soul. And 
I had another conversation like that uh, a couple weeks ago, but I can't share it. Um, number three, when our presence does not condone sin or the mocking of God and or when the sinners are not our fellow believers. That's one of those clear lines that Paul drew um, in Corinthians. He said, I hear there's a, what is it, a guy sleeping with his mother's daughter, uncle, or something like that, some weird thing, you know? And Paul said, that's not good. You, you can't just let that go on. You got you to gotta confront that because he's calling himself a believer. We are called to evaluate, and you might call it judgment. We are called to evaluate each other's behavior when it's clearly out of line. So there's a lot of qualifications to this idea of engaging our culture. And, and I'm, I'm just kind of throwing that stuff out because what I'm hoping is that we get better at engaging with unbelievers. But there have to be some boundaries on how we do that, when we do that, and how effective it's going to be if we cross lines versus stay inside the lines that I think the Lord has provided us right here. So that's what a, I think a discipling culture has to have. Firm foundation of broken people who are hungry for change. And secondly, to know when to apply all of Scripture to our relationships with those who don't yet know the Lord. Uh, something to apply? Does that make sense? Is it helpful? Yeah. yeah, it's kind of a serious topic, but I think we want to be serious about this. People's lives are at stake. So I want to, uh, again, just pray with you and, and ask if um, you would commit to continuing to love and accept people right where they are, but know clearly what the Lord has taught you personally about their potential in Christ and kind of have his agenda on your mind the entire time. But be good also at looking at people's weaknesses and saying, man, if Jesus got a hold of you, flip that thing around, wow, you'd be such a dynamo for God. And even say those things if you get the opportunity. So Father, we just pray that you would help us to not only uh, be hungry followers of you, but also, Lord, uh, give us the courage to engage those around us at work, after work, on the weekends, in our neighborhoods. Build friendships with them, Lord, and uh, help us find ways to patiently, graciously, but persistently draw them away from their lostness into the kingdom where they can be found where they can be found by you, Lord. Because we know the days are short, Lord. The time is coming close when you will return. And things are going to get worse before they get better. So, Father, help us not to just turn a blind eye to those around us who don't know you, but to constantly be available to you, Lord, so you can use us to be your hands, your feet, and especially your mouth, so we can speak your words of life to those we love. I'm going to ask you to pray one more thing, too. If there's a person that you've been thinking about this morning, or someone the Lord brought to your mind that you think, ah, I got, now I have, I have a plan. I, I think I know what to do next. And you want to just begin to put that person at the forefront of your mind in prayer and then just begin to apply some of the things the Lord told you this morning. I want you to raise your hand and say, I've got somebody in mind. I've got somebody in mind. Good. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So, Father, give us the courage and your strategy on how to go forward with these folks that we love, that you love, that you died for. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, God bless you. Thank you for making it this morning and uh, braving the weather. By next week, I was going to say it should all be cleared out, but it could be another foot. Who knows? <laughs> all right. God bless you. Hey, if you have a ballot, don't forget to turn that in or a mission commitment. And we'll see you next Sunday.